I wanted to talk about uh, a little bit about the Ito calculus today, but then on looking over it, I realized that it's a little formal, and uh, it's not very clear to me that it really fits into physical applications of stochastic processes. But I'll try to get back to it. I'm trying to write it out. I'm trying to say it in as simple a form as possible, and I haven't quite succeeded. So, since I don't want to get into a whole lot of formalism at, in this class. Uh, we will take a rain check on it. I will come back to it a little later because I would like to see what is the simplest way of saying it, explicitly saying it and so on. I mentioned a few things yesterday about the fact that it makes a difference when you have multiplicative noise as opposed to additive noise and it is a question of how you interpret, how, how you handle this uh, quantity dw which is the increment in a Wiener process. You certainly can't write dw as dw over dt times dt because it's not differentiable. So that's where the root of the problem is, and I'm still you know, playing with the idea of uh, playing with how to present this in a simple enough form. So we'll take a rain check on it. Meanwhile, there is one topic uh, which is of practical importance in the study of noise and stochastic processes, occurs all the time, and it's a simple enough thing once you make a sufficient number of assumptions and it's got as I said a lot of practical uh, applications and this has to do with the following question. Given a random process in time and we are going to assume for this purpose sufficiently smooth random process in time, uh, one could ask what is the rate at which or one could ask how often does this process cross some prescribed threshold. So you could say there is some level in this process and you would like to know the statistics of the level crossings of this process. So that is a very, very general uh, statement and we will try to make it specific. So level crossing statistics, so let us look again at a process x of t and I am going to assume that this is a continuous process that is number one. And secondly, it is not as irregular as Brownian motion which uh, to which this formalism is not applicable for reasons which will become clear. Okay. But if you plot this a typical realization of this process as a function of time, we will assume it is an ongoing process. We do not have to assume that it is a stationary process that is very important because in practice what can happen is the following. You might for instance record the rainfall continuously as a function of time the precipitation as a function of time and this is going to be irregular, it is going to fluctuate etc. And you would like to know when uh, the precipitation exceeds per unit per hour or something like that, exceeds a certain threshold value, you would like to see the statistics of this thing happen. Now this could change with the seasons very slowly, so it is not a stationary process definitely. So whatever we are going to write down will be applicable even to non-stationary processes with some provisos, but if it is stationary then things will become simpler as you will see. Okay. So it is some ongoing random process as a function of uh, time <coughs> x of t and it goes up and down in this fashion there is some kind of irregular process of this kind. Okay. And then you ask I would like to know the statistics of when it crosses some prescribed threshold, it could even be the origin it does not matter. So some threshold like this, so we put in a value A and this is uh, a prescribed threshold and I would like to know about the statistics of these points where it crosses this, crosses over onto the other side. Okay. For that purpose I realized that the immediate thing to do is to define another random process, so let us call this process u of t which is equal to 0 if x is below a and equal to 1 if x is above a, so theta of x of t minus a. Okay. And I plot this then schematically what happens if I plot u on the same graph is that this point here in this interval u is unity, it is up there and then it remains 0 till over this range, well it is not a bad, so let us do it this way, 
So over this range, it's again positive, so it remains, goes like that. And then there is a piece here and so on. So this is what u of t does and this is unity here. So the problem has become much simpler. We don't care about the variation of x itself. We only want to know is it above the threshold or not. In other words, when is u 0, when is it 1 and that's it. Okay. Now what we want, what we are getting at is the statistics of these instants of time. So it's convenient to plot not u but u dot of t. You can imagine formally differentiating this process. Of course, these are all singular quantities, but you can differentiate a step function to get a delta function, right. Then u dot of t equal to a delta function of x of t minus a, but it is got an x dot of t also because you have to differentiate this quantity. Okay. Now, what does u dot actually look like? It is going to fire whenever x of t hits a, namely at these points, at all these points. But suppose it hits a at one particular value at some time t, then this delta function if you convert it to a delta function in time is going to have a divided by is going to be t minus whatever it is at that instant t minus t i. So a typical 0 would look like this thing would look like delta of t minus t i but it would be divided by the modulus of x dot at this point at this t i because that is what this uh, delta function does when you convert it to a delta function in t. But there is an x dot sitting on top. Okay. So x dot divided by mod x dot is plus 1 if x dot is positive and minus 1 if x dot is negative. So what we have is a delta function here of unit strength out here and one at this point of unit strength in the opposite direction. And similarly there is an up crossing here so it goes up and there is a down crossing here so it goes down up etc. So this process u dot is just a sequence of pulse it is a pulse sequence in which you have plus 1 if it goes up and minus 1 if it goes down. Okay. So the matter is now very straightforward. What we got to do is to find for instance the number of crossings in a given interval of time. You would like to know the number of uh, threshold crossings in some time interval say t1 to t2, let us call it n a t1 t2, okay, this number and what is this equal to? It is just the count of all these delta functions, you just have to integrate over t this quantity and that is it this uh, u dot and that counts it automatically making sure that you have the modulus of course. So this is equal to integral t1 to t2 dt and then you need mod x dot of t delta of x of t minus a. That counts 1 for each of these guys because I put a modulus there and that is it. Now this is a random variable because these points t sub i are at random okay, because x itself is varying randomly with time. Okay. So now we can proceed to look at the statistics of this number n, what is the average number etc. etc. So we could ask over all realizations of this x of t, different realizations in the given time interval t1 to t2, what is the average number of crossings, level crossings. Okay. So that will immediately be expectation n this quantity will be equal to what it is the first there is an integral over this t1 to t2 dt and then 
these are random variables these guys are random variables so now you can see that it depends not only on x but also on the random on the random process x dot hmm? we have not assumed stationarity or anything like that so these probabilities will be time dependent okay and what you need here is the joint distribution or density function not only of x but also x dot together we have looked at earlier we have looked at cases for a diffusing particle of the joint distribution of the position and velocity. So, you need a thing like that in this case in this general situation. So, you need some uh, p of x x dot and t because this guy could be time dependent this probability density and you have to integrate over all possible minus infinity to infinity dx integral minus infinity to infinity dx dot, but you also have modulus x dot. So, that is the formal expression for the expected or average number of crossings of this threshold A. If you set A equal to 0 uh, sorry times this we need this guy also delta of sorry times a delta function of x minus a that is sitting here. Uh, so, this is equal to integral t 1 t 2 d t minus infinity to infinity d x dot that remains x dot and then this density function at the value a of x dot and t because there is a delta function here I can get rid of this integration over x. Okay. If you put a equal to 0 you get the number of 0 crossings okay. the average number of 0 crossings. Okay. So, the matter is not quite trivial because you need this joint density and then in that density you have to set a particular value whatever threshold value it is and then you have to do this integral here. What would the variance of this number be like? Okay, that gets harder and harder. So the variance formally would require the mean square. So you would require n squared of a t1 t2. This would be equal to at this uh, formal level, it would be equal to integral t1 to t2 dt integral t1 to t2 dt prime. Uh, integral minus infinity to infinity d x 1 dot say d x 2 dot minus infinity to infinity mod x 1 dot mod x 2 dot these guys would be there and then a p of and now it is a joint density. So, it is a x 1 dot t a x 2 dot T prime. This two time joint density is also required probability or density is also required okay. and formally you have to do this and then of course, in general you require the moment generating function of this which would become fairly complicated, but that is the formal expression as it stands. Can we tell what is going to happen can we very often you would like to know what are the up crossings and what are the down crossings like. So, you would like to look at the distribution of these points where it is crossing upwards like this and then the distribution of the down crossings right. So, if you call that n n minus for instance, so if I call n plus up crossings number of up crossings. Uh, of a t 1 t 2 what would this be equal to it would be equal to integral t 1 to t 2 let us let us find the average number that is what we are interested in in general this is equal to what should I do here is the number of crossings actual crossings what should I do if I want just the up crossings. Yeah. 
the integral over x is trivial that is gone it is just you replace it by a pardon me yeah I must integrate dx dot from 0 to infinity because it is going up that means x is increasing. Hmm? So, the integral runs dt integral 0 to infinity dx dot and then there is no need for the modulus it is x dot p of uh, a x dot t that is the up crossings okay. and what about down crossings n minus of a uh, what are we yes that is right. So, a t 1 t 2 again integral d t t 1 to t 2 and what should I do for down crossings I want to count the number of times it goes downwards from above a it crosses to below a. Well, clearly x dot is negative because x is decreasing, right? So, what do I integrate over? Minus, Minus infinity to 0. What I should put is mod x1 dot, uh, mod x dot clearly, right? To kind of, so, that is the same as minus is quite right dx dot x dot p of a x dot t. Okay. Now, this quantity here. this guy here this is the expected or average number of crossings in this time interval here. It is equal to the mean rate of crossings multiplied by the time interval integrated over the time interval and the rate may be dependent on time that is the reason why you have a t here explicitly. If the process is not stationary the rate itself might change with time right. So, this integral equal to mean rate of level crossings at time t ok. So, it may change from time to time and we could call it uh, equal to some r of a t. And of course, this obvious definition for the mean rate of uh, up crossings, mean rate of down crossings and so on ok. So, if you give me the joint density in x and x dot then whether it is stationary or not I can formally write down assuming of course, the process is differentiable and so on. I can write down a formula for the average number of crossings which is very straightforward here ok. Now, if the process should turn out to be stationary if x is stationary then x dot is of course, stationary differentiation makes it does not change anything. Then this uh, joint densities and so on would be the steady state densities. Mm. Then if you know that joint density one can actually compute what this rate is. Mm. So, let us do it in the simplest case that we have available Gaussian process ok for which we actually know what the density looks like, but we need it for both x and v. So, we need a process in which x is stationary and x dot is also stationary. The normal diffusion of a free particle we know that x dot is stationary if you use the Langevin model, but x is not stationary. On the other hand can you think of an example again involving uh, one dimensional motion where both x and v are stationary? We may need to look for a process where there is no long range diffusion because then of course, the variance of x becomes in, in infinite and then it and it diverges with time and it is not stationary. So, what is the problem which is a standard problem which has got Pardon me? Yeah, the Ornstein Ollenbeck. Now, there is a little problem with Ornstein Ollenbeck 
thing as we apply it to the velocity. That is an exercise for you, we are going to do that. Uh, we have the joint, we have the conditional probability density, hmm? conditional probability density we have for the velocity. Okay? We do not have it with the acceleration included, we have not put that in at all for the velocity process, we have not done that yet. Hmm? So, it is a little tricky. We are not talking here about conditional densities at all. What we have are probability densities, joint probability densities in a variable and its time derivative. Huh? The Ornstein Uhlenbeck for the velocity actually gave you P of V T given a V naught. This is not what we are interested in at all. Hmm? What we are interested in is a probability density that gives V v dot and possibly as a function of t. Hmm? Now, let us go back and since you mentioned this example, let us look at the particle which obeys the free Langevin equation and it looks like this v dot equal to minus gamma v plus the square root of gamma over m eta of t. We can in principle compute this density here v and v dot. But remember what is going to happen, this v dot is going to involve white noise here, which is not differentiable, it is not smooth. So, there are singularities here in this problem. So, we cannot talk about things where you have a white noise, a bare white noise of this kind. Somehow, it has got to be this white noise has to be ameliorated, um, inside it has got to be made mild, it has got to be made harmless and you must have a stationary distribution hmm, for both a variable and its time derivative. Okay. And even this is not enough when we want to find for instance uh, the square and so on, we need the joint velocity distribution at v 1 at t 1, v 2 at time t 2 and so on. Hmm. That is not so trivial. So, what is the other example? Again an Ornstein Uhlenbeck process, but not connected with the velocity. Hmm? What was the other problem we did where you had a steady state in both a stationary distribution in both position and velocity? Yeah, we put an external potential. What sort of potential? The harmonic oscillator potential, the harmonically bound particle. We found this uh, object had a stationary distribution, right. In fact, we found the stationary distribution. So, we found in this case uh, for uh, harmonically bound particle, we are not talking about the conditional density at all, we are just talking about the probability density. more. So, we have p of x, v and t or x dot and t in this case, but this was stationary, this then distribution was stationary because the system is in equilibrium, both the position and the velocity have Gaussian distributions. Okay. So, we know that this is not there at all, it is stationary in this problem and what is this equal to? What is the joint distribution of the position and the velocity for a harmonically bound particle? Each of them is a Gaussian and you know this from equilibrium statistical mechanics. It is just the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution for each of them e to the minus energy over k t normalized. right? So, what is it for uh, what, what is this guy here for the velocity? Yeah, it is m over 2 pi k Boltzmann t to the half e to the minus m v squared over 2 k Boltzmann t and it is multiplied by the distribution in the position that is it right. So, this is m omega naught squared over 2 pi k Boltzmann t e to the minus m omega naught squared over 2 k Boltzmann x squared that is all we need, that is all we need here. 
and you have to plug that in instead of x dot I called it b here you have to plug it in and that is the end of the matter right. So, let us see what this rate looks like for such a process let us write down in general what the rate looks like in this Gaussian case. So, we have uh, p of x x dot equal to 1 over 2 pi and then sigma x square root of sigma x squared and then there is a variance in x dot that is sigma x dot in this fashion mm, e to the minus x squared over 2 sigma x squared minus x dot squared over 2 sigma x dot squared that is what the p of x x dot is and now let us ask what is the level crossing threshold in x it is between some, some number a specify some number a then what we need is the following r of a at any time t but it is exactly the same at all times. So, it is stationary so the rate at which the mean rate at which this oscillator crosses some point a on the x axis mm, both upwards and downwards this is 1 over 2 pi sigma x sigma x dot and then what do we get e to the minus. So, we have to do this we have to do this integral. So, e to the minus a squared over 2 sigma x squared because all I have to do is to set x equal to a in there and then an integral minus infinity to infinity dx dot mod x dot of there e to the minus x dot squared over 2 sigma x dot squared. I have to do this integral, hmm? but that is not difficult because there is an x dot sitting here. So, what does that give us this is equal to first of all let us write this as twice the integral from 0 to infinity and get rid of the mod. So, this 2 goes away out here and you are stuck with this. So, let us put uh, let us put x dot squared over 2 sigma x dot squared equal to some u. So, it says uh, x dot d x dot uh, the 2 cancels over sigma x dot squared equal to d u. So, let us move the sigma x squared up there sigma x dot squared d u. So, now that is going to give me 0 to infinity d u e to the minus u and that is 1, but there is a sigma x dot squared multiplying it. So, there is a sigma x dot so this is the general formula when you have a Gaussian process and both x and x dot are stationary Gaussian processes. Okay. Of course, we could have computed the up crossing down crossing etcetera in this case it would be half if, if you put a equal to 0 then it would be completely symmetric about that point. Right. In particular notice that uh, r of 0 the 0 crossings equal to sigma x dot over pi sigma x and that is it this factor becomes unity. Hmm. Now, let us see whether this is physically reasonable or not in the, in the case that we know uh, in this problem in the oscillator problem hmm, sigma x equal to square root of k b t over m omega naught squared and sigma the velocity sigma x dot 
equal to square root of k v t over m. Right. So, what does this ratio become? Mm. Omega naught by pi. Is there a factor of two missing somewhere? I have to be a little careful here. Uh, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. What's the time period of this oscillator? The unperturbed oscillator. Two pi over omega naught, right? So t over two. Every half period, on the average, it crosses the axis uh, x equal to zero. Of course. That is exactly what it does. Okay. So, this big rigmarole here, it is actually in this trivial case, it is given us the right answer. So, it checks this answer out. Okay. But you now have an explicit formula for when it crosses any value A. Any value. Hmm. How come this oscillator does not have any fixed amplitude? It is going. From, there is a probability of finding it arbitrarily far from the origin, but the variance is finite. The variance of this uh, oscillator in the steady state is finite, stationary state, but there is a probability of finding it anywhere. Why is that? Yeah, it is in contact with the heat bath at temperature T, so its energy is not fixed, and as you know, the energy determines the amplitude, right. The energy can be arbitrarily large. Of course, it becomes less and less probable that it is moved far away in one direction or in the other direction. It is going to stay near the origin most of the time. It is Gaussian after all, peaked about the origin. But the fact is, there is a non zero probability of it being arbitrarily far from the origin, and this is the, the rate at which that threshold is crossed. It gets much smaller as A becomes significant, as you can see for a given temperature. Of course, if the temperature is increased then sigma x squared is also increased and then A can become larger as exactly as you would expect. Okay. So, even the 0 crossings are taken care of in this problem. Okay. Now, the difficulty of course, is that you need this variance to be finite. You need this variance uh, to be finite. You could now ask a slightly more complicated question. What about the maxima and minima? of this random variable. We have said it has got a nice uh, realizations, the, sam the sample paths are nice and smooth and so on. What about maxima and minima? So, let us see what happens there and it is related to this problem. So, distribution or crossing of, uh, so the, uh, we will try to should really say the distribution of extrema. Now, we have in mind a sample path which looks like this. looks like this and I want the statistics of these points. So, I do the same thing as before. I say look from a minimum to a maximum the slope is positive. The slope is 0 at extrema. So, I now construct u of t to be equal to theta function of x dot of t. So, I am trying to find out the statistics of all these segments here. So, in this segment this guy is positive, then again in this segment the guy is positive and so on and 0 in the segments where theta dot is uh, where x dot is negative. So, between a maximum and a minimum this, this process is 0 and between a minimum and a maximum it remains 1 plus 1. And as before if I compute, so this is u, if I compute, if I calculate u dot the up crossings would correspond to unit delta function with plus 1 weight and the down crossings would correspond to minus 1 weight. So, the maxima would correspond to minus 1 weight and the minima would correspond to plus 1 weight. 
So, u dot equal to x double dot of t delta function of x dot of t. So, now I could ask okay, what about uh, the mean the, the mean number of these extrema in some time interval. Okay. So, the number of maxima mean number of extrema in T 1 to T 2 equal to n of T 1 T 2. This is equal to an integral from T 1 to T 2 d T and then I have to compute this quantity here. So, the number would say take modulus here x double dot of T delta of x dot of T formally is what it is. Hmm. What I am interested in is over all realizations I want to know the mean number. So, I already wrote mean number this is the mean, mean number is equal to expectation of this equal to, but I also have to integrate here. So, let us kill this integral what should I integrate over? What should I integrate over? So, there is going to be definitely an x double dot and then a delta of x dot that is going to sit there. So, there is definitely an integral over these guys. So, integral minus infinity to infinity d x d x dot d x double dot all are there. Because the process itself is x of t and I have to integrate over its density times the joint density of x x dot x double dot perhaps at time t if it is not stationary. But in any case I need the joint density of not only the variable, but its derivative and its second derivative. So, this makes sense only if the function is twice differentiable in some sense some precise sense. Okay. Generally you would call the mean square differentiable that is the way the stochastic process would have differentiability put into it, but you need sufficient smoothness to do this. And of course, as usual you can get rid of the x dot integral using the delta function. So, this thing here becomes equal to integral t 1 to t 2 d t integral d x integral d x double dot times mod x double dot and this is over all values minus infinity to infinity, but then a joint density which is x 0 x double dot and maybe t. So, this quantity now this full integral gives you the, the rate at which the extrema occur. And as before if you assign a sign to x double dot we would be able to tell the maxima from the minima. Okay. All you have to do is to make ask when is this positive or negative and then you can separate the positive from the maxima from the minima. Okay. What if I say look I am not interested in these maxima and minima I am only interested in maxima and minima which are above some threshold. So, I am interested in this, this and any minimum above this what should I do then? Put in a so do not consider this put in a theta function put in another theta function which says x is bigger than a hmm? and go through the same process as before. So, that is not a that is a small extension of these formulas. So, you can always change to any arbitrary threshold and say I am not interested in fluctuation in extrema at small values I am interested in it beyond a certain threshold. Now, what can we say about this in a Gaussian process? Suppose I tell you that you have a Gaussian process in which x, x dot and x double dot 
all of them are Gaussians yeah, and it is a stationary process all, all these are stationary random variables then what does this p look like in that case. We wrote it down for the case of 2 Gaussians what we need to do is to do a generalization of that to 3 but there is a little wrinkle that appears here which you have to be careful about. I have not discussed multivariate Gaussians in great detail or in any detail in this class but what happens then is the following this fellow here let, let me write the general formula down. So, p of x x dot x double dot in the case when they are all stationary when they are all Gaussian and stationary. This thing looks like the following hmm? you need to define a covariance matrix the moment you have a multivariate Gaussian you need to define a covariance matrix and it looks like this it is 1 over there is this 2 pi square root for each of these factors. So, there is a 3 halves and then there is a determinant of this covariance matrix let us call it gamma to the power half e to the power minus hmm, 1 half the usual standard half is sits there and then I need a notation I need a little notation now. So, let me I should not call it x uh, let me call it let me call it xi some vector this stands for x x dot x double dot ok. So, you put this thing in a column vector and then it is e to the half xi transpose gamma inverse xi out there is this guy mm. where this uh, covariance matrix gamma looks like this it is got sigma x squared sigma x dot squared sigma x double dot squared in the diagonal elements and then there is a 0 but there is a sigma x dot squared here and a minus sigma x dot squared here. That is what this matrix looks like and you need to find its inverse and plug it in here and so on. Crucial thing is this this guy sits here in general any multivariate Gaussian you know that. Uh, So, you plug this in into this expression do this integral and you know you now have uh, in the stationary case this integration is trivial it is t 1 minus t 2 times a rate out here okay. and you can compute the rate of crossings. Okay. Now, the real interest comes when you have uh, a noise of some kind about which you do not know much perhaps you can make a Gaussian assumption, but you do not know very much more about this we would like to interpret what this whole thing is like what what are these things really trying to tell you and so on. Um, for this we need the concept of the power spectrum of the noise I have not talked about this at all yet, but this is now the time to introduce it because we are now going to talk about noise processes of various kinds not necessarily Markovian not necessarily described by master equations, but we look at various kinds of noise uh, for a while now. So, let me define first a power spectrum or power spectral density or power We will do this in the simplest case first a one dimensional process first and let us look at a process which is stationary. So, we have a lot uh, if you if the process is xi you know that uh, considerable amount of information is carried by this autocorrelation function here you can write down various properties of it and things like that we kind of expect that as t becomes very large this will decay to 0 from some finite mean square value etcetera. 
Now, this power spectral density is defined as S, it is very simple S i of omega as just the Fourier transform of this. Okay. It is a function of T, it is a nice smooth function of T in general. So, it is Fourier transform is the and I will tell you what the use of this uh, definition is, what it is going to do or what it actually is measuring. So, minus infinity to infinity d t, we need to choose a Fourier transform convention. So, I have chosen one. Uh, Now, in physical terms what it does is once you measure this and xi is some kind of noise or random process, it measures the strength of this of these fluctuations when you Fourier transform this. It tells you what is the intensity in some frequency window between omega and omega plus t omega. That is what this guy does here. And uh, by the way, all the others are matters of convention, the plus sign here, the 1 over 2 pi here, etcetera, etcetera. Engineers normally define this as twice the Fourier transform without this 2 pi factor and so on. But these are we, we will stick to one convention, we will stick to this thing here. Now, what is the import of this whole business? It will turn out, and we will see this explicitly, that when you have some noise driving another variable which also becomes noisy as a consequence, then the power spectra of the input and output variables are related to each other. Okay. In fact, the response of the system is measured by what is called a transfer function between these two, which is dependent on the power spectra of the input and the output variables. And there is a theorem called the wiener kinchin theorem, which I am going to talk about and which we will exploit, which will quantify this relationship between the input and output. So, this is basically what this does. Now, in the cases we have looked at, in the simplest cases we have looked at, we, we can write down what this guy is and then we will come back and look at its significance in greater detail. First, this Gaussian white noise that we had, we had a noise eta which uh, essentially said the eta of t, eta of t prime is delta of t minus t prime stationary process. So, this is just a delta function. So, S eta of omega is equal to that was a 0 mean Gaussian process. By the way, I am assuming that the mean is 0 here, otherwise, the correlation is delta x xi uh, of 0 delta xi here, the different deviation from the mean, the correlation of the deviation from the mean. So, when this is just a delta function, this just gives you 1, so it is 1 or 2 pi equal to a constant. So, that is another way of defining white noise. It says that uh, when you do a Fourier transform, there is equal intensity at all frequencies. Of course, it is unphysical because certainly some energy is involved in producing this noise. It is clear that you cannot have arbitrarily high frequencies the same intensity. Okay. So, that is a mathematical idealization. By the way, what was uh, S v of omega? in the case when you had a Langevin particle. So, remember that this process was defined by V dot is minus gamma V plus square root of gamma over M eta of T. What is this equal to? What we need to do here is to put in the value for the correlation function, right. So, this is equal to 1 over 2 pi integral minus infinity to infinity d t e to the i omega t and then what is the correlation function of this velocity process? The stationary velocity process it is e to the minus gamma t that is the whole idea the velocity correlation time was gamma inverse and it died down with one correlation time it was a Markov process so exponentially correlated right. And then the strength was 1 over, so it was 1 over 2 pi k b t over m that is the mean square value of this guy times integral z minus infinity to infinity d t e to the i omega t e to the minus gamma modulus t modulus t die down on both sides in this fashion. So, of course, that is a trivial integral to do first thing to do is to remove this thing and make it twice 
uh, twice 0 to infinity e to the minus gamma t hmm. and what is that going to be? Sorry, before, before we do that let us leave it like this minus infinity to infinity with a 2 pi e to the i omega t, but I break that up into cosine and sine and the sine vanishes because the rest of the integrand is in even function mod t here. So, I get rid of this 0 to infinity and then there is a cos omega t only the real part survives and what is this guy? What is this integral? We've all got in mind. That's a, that's a, is it um, is it gamma over gamma squared plus omega squared or omega over omega gamma squared plus omega squared? I, I'm I'm sure this is done by I don't know things have changed. So I'm sure you've done this e to the minus a x cos b x or sin b x. I'm sure you've done this integral, right? These are elementary integrals. What you have to do is to write e to the minus a x plus i b x and that is trivial to do and then you take real and imaginary parts you get each of these integrals right. So, what is this answer for the cosine a over a squared plus b squared or b over a squared plus b squared how do you decide? Even simpler way of how do you decide? put b equal to 0. If you put b equal to 0 this just becomes e to the minus a x for the cosine and it becomes 0 for sin. So, the sin must have b on top the sin integral right. <laughs> okay. So, this is gamma over gamma squared plus omega squared. So, it is gamma over pi 1 over gamma squared plus omega squared crucial part is this what does it look like it is a Lorentzian shape. Hmm. So, now you see what is happening the effect of this the effect of the fact the fact that there is inertia in this problem tells you you cannot shake this particle arbitrarily high frequencies with equal amplitude. Mm -hmm. So, what does the power spectrum do as a function of omega when omega becomes large it dies down like 1 over omega squared whereas, the noise that drives it has equal power everywhere at all frequencies, but the response because there is inertia in the problem and damping in the problem this response does not follow the stimulus it is sluggish and this dies down as omega squared for large values. Hmm. We will see more about this and uh, the more interesting cases are where this dies down the, the power spectrum dies down like a power of omega which lies between 0.8 and 1.2 or something it is called 1 over f noise. We will say a little bit about that ok. So, let me stop here today, but we will take up the idea of the power spectrum and what it does in greater detail.